The Absolute 52 Fly is not a new boat exactly. It's been around for 16 or 17 months and we've seen her at various international shows over the last year or so. But it is a very good ambassador for what the latest generation of Flybridge Cruisers is all about from Absolute. So we've come down to Verazzi near Genoa to take her out on the water and see what she can do. Now, the lower helm on this Absolute 52 Fly really is a bit of a treat. Now, the space for two seats, we just have the one with a little bit of extra space for storage just here to your left-hand side. We've also got a skipper's side door right here with pretty good access to that side deck and some tying off points. And when that's open, it kind of narrows down that walkway because it's a relatively narrow side deck. They really concentrated on generating maximum volume inside. So it does restrict that a bit but uh, you'd certainly rather have a skipper's side door than not. And as for the helm station itself, well, it's really impressive. Maybe the best I've seen on a boat in this sector, and rather than just having a flat dash panel, what we've got is a kind of wraparound setup here, all on the angle. So your two plotters, I think, what are they? They're probably 16 inch plotters, a pair of 16 inch plotters at different angles. So if you're getting glare from one, you don't get glare from the other. So that's a really nice touch. Huge compass in the center here, adjustable wheel, very comfortable seat and everything you want to your right hand side. We've got our twin throttles, our joystick and our bow thruster there. On the left hand side, just uh, the engine date displays, a little bit of switch gear and a wireless charger for your phone. So let's get her underway and see how she does. We've got trim assist off, we've got it on single lever, so we'll have a little play. Now this boat doesn't come with engine options. What you get is IPS 800, so a pair of Volvo Penta D8 600, 600 horsepower a piece, which is not a huge amount of power for a boat like this, a flybridge cruiser measuring the best part of 55 feet. But there's a really decent bit of poke there. We're getting up to 20 knots already. And the pitch of the boat feels pretty good, no more than a couple of degrees as we ascend our own hump and come back down onto the plane. But what's really interesting here, and I noticed this in camera when I first saw this boat, I had a look at their performance figures, and it suggested that you're pretty much planing at 12 knots. At that kind of pace, you're seeing nine liters per nautical mile. And from there, we've got a descending limb. It goes down to around about eight liters per nautical mile at 20 knots, and just 8.5 liters at the maximum 30 knots. So that's really impressive. That's such a wide cruising band. And it means if you've got someone nervous on board, you can cruise at 12, 15 knots without drinking too much fuel. And if you prefer, you can throttle right on and have a bit of a play. And all the while, you're achieving between 160 and 180 nautical miles in terms of range from that 1800 litre fuel tank with 20% in reserve. And you've got to say, as I throw about a bit, refinement is pretty good too. And there's a slightly hard sounding ride from those forward hull quarters. And we're not really seeing much in the way of swells today. But in terms of the noise readings, well, we're seeing around about 65 decibels at 20 knots, which is lovely and quiet. And that only increases to 70 decibels at the very top end, the 30 knot top end. So really, this isn't a boat where you've got a sensible cruising band and then a hooligans kind of pace at the top end. This is a boat where it treats you to proper cruising comfort at everything beyond about 12 knots. Let's throw her into a little turn to starboard. There's a decent bit of heel. Lots of visibility as well. I've got to say for a uh, flybridge cruiser, huge windows. And although we've got all those windows closed so we can measure the uh, sound readings, well, it's certainly not a problem to ventilate this lower deck either big open inside windows on the port side. We've got the skipper side door and three part patio doors aft. So actually, if you want a through draft, it's not a problem at all. You certainly don't need to be using the air conditioning on a day like this. Now, the only thing that I would criticize at all about that lower helm is the fact that if you're a sociable sort of fella, well, it's a little bit isolated, a single helm on the starboard side, no companion seating. So you're pretty much on your own and that's all remedied up here on the flybridge. An enormous dinette on the starboard side that extends into a sunbed that goes well forward of this helm station on the port side. We've also got a co-pilot seat here. 
which keeps things extra sociable. And again, it's a very well-spec helm, only the one MFD, but plenty of space for your switch gear, your cup holders, your fusion remote, your VHF. And again, we've got the throttles, the thruster, and the joystick, all available for your left hand. So it's well set up. Let's have a little drive and see how she does from up here. As you would expect, you're not especially well protected by that uh, wind deflector, but that's because it extends such a good way forward. That's what gives you the space for all that lovely companion seat, and so I'm okay with that. And let's face it, if you're coming to helm on the flybridge, you expect a little bit of wind in your face. Visibility is as good as you would expect. Some pretty substantial mouldings here behind me, but they don't actually get in the way to any substantial degree. And of course, when you're up here, being that bit further from the center of roll, and when you heel them into a good turn, it's all the more enjoyable. Nice and stable though, very little in the way of flex. And what I also like up here is the fact that the space in front of this helm station is not wasted. We've got a little compartment just here, which is a great space just to chuck all your canvases when you take them off your various chairs and cushions. There's not much of a sea state here today, but I do have to say, the uh, dryness of this boat is pretty impressive. We've hunted out a few of our own swells, a few weights from passing ships, and actually nothing's made its way onto the foredeck, onto the side decks, or onto the wind deflector itself. It's already settled and well behaved. And of course, with those twin 600 horsepower diesels, it's not a performance boat. 30 knots is 30 knots, but it does everything right throughout that range very, very effectively indeed. One other thing to mention while we're up here is the intelligence behind the design and layout of these helm stations. Now, as I say, the lower helm is very impressive given that this is predominantly a med style boat, so people tend to be helming up top. But because that's positioned on the starboard side, they position the upper helm on the port side, and there's also the option of a third helm back in that cockpit. So, in terms of easy seamanship, you really do have all bases covered. We're back alongside in Verazzi now, so while we're up here, it's worth taking a look at some of the details. Now, as I say, a port helm, good size, a pair of seats each with individual bolsters, which is good to see. Further forward, the companion seating goes well forward of the helm console, built into the leading edge, as I say, is a little space big enough for your canvases and covers. That makes plenty of sense. And if I move out here and face aft, you'll see the scale of this is really very good. Position just there in the lee of that wind deflector. So pretty comfortable. Big enough for three people very easily, perhaps four or five if you're happy to sit. And the headrest here can be reversed to face aft. And when you do so, you create a dinette on that starboard side that's big enough, I would say, for eight people, probably. You do have to be careful, though, as you're making your way back from that sun pad into the shelter of the T-top, because the leading edge of that T-top will clatter you in the head if you're not very careful. I haven't been. I've hit myself in the head two or three times today. But moving aft, you see there's a transverse wet bar built into the back edge of that dinette. Really attractive granite-style work surface, stainless sink and an electric griddle there on the starboard side. Down below, you have exactly what you would want. We've got a ice maker there and a fridge there, so you don't have to go downstairs to sort yourself out the drinks. Decent storage too. A little bit of storage in here that would slide around a little actually because there's no lip to prevent it doing so. And a really big space under here that's currently filled with covers which have been removed from the freestanding furniture that lines the back end of this deck. Now, it's the same principle up here as down below. Open deck space, freestanding furniture you can shift about to your heart's content so it fits in with the activity of the day. We'll pop down to the cockpit now and see how that works. Now, there are some guys in the cockpit right now. We'll shift ourselves out onto the lazarette and down onto the swim platform. <coughs> Now this is something we've seen on other boats in the range. This glass parapet and facing settees. So you can keep this transom wide open, keep the views wide open. And interestingly, 
it's slightly asymmetrical. On the face of it, you'd think it's symmetrical, but actually the port side deck there, the port steps are narrower than those on the starboard side. That gives you plenty of space here for your telescopic passerelle. And there's your shore power just buried under there neatly so it doesn't get in the way. And although this is a boat principally designed to enable a family user to operate without crew, we do have a crew cabin here at the transom. Let's open that up. As you can see, there's an opening hatch in the deck as well, which gives you tremendous access down into this space. And when you get down inside here, what we get directly ahead is the wet room. The toilet's positioned in there to make best use of space. There's also a sink and a little mirror. And if I spin around, your single bed runs transverse towards the port side. It's got good views, so a nice big window, an opening porthole there, and another window there on the starboard side with plenty of storage. And given the size of the boat, it's a very impressive crew cabin. But of course, as I say, this is not necessarily a boat designed with crew in mind. So if you don't want crew, then you get rid of the mattress and simply use it as a storage facility, which is exactly what's going on here. You still get the heads compartment though, which is very useful. Essentially gives you an alfresco day heads. So you don't have to head inside and use the facilities on the lower deck. And let's climb back up into the cockpit. Do you have the number of the one in my and you'll see that once again, just as up top, we've got freestanding furniture here. If I bend down, you'll see that they come in two forms. We've got basic legs here with a gap underneath. And we have these ones with a molded unit at the base to provide extra storage capacity. And it makes loads of sense. It means you don't have to spec a specific layout in the factory. You can just shift these about and organize your cockpit in whatever way suits your day out. This makes plenty of sense too. Over here on the starboard side, this is our third helm, the one we mentioned earlier, and it's well arranged. We've got your uh, bow thruster there. We've got your joystick here, a little fusion remote here. And if you place your hand on that joystick, well, your view's fantastic. You can see the parameters of the boat there, absolutely no problem at all. Access to the engine room is achieved right in the middle of the cockpit here through a hatch. It's a decent size of aperture with a ladder here on the port side to get down, but access is a little bit limited on the test boat because right down there, as you can see, that big box there is your generator. But let's see if we can climb down inside. It's a bit warm down in here, having just taken them out. Now ahead of that box, we've got another white box. That is your sea keeper. And if I move towards the sea keeper and spin around, you'll see that the space in here is all pretty well used. Here are our engines, a pair of IPS 800s, that's Volvo Penta's D8, 600 horsepower, 7.7 .7 litre block, inline six cylinder. Not a huge amount of horsepower for a boat of this scale, as I say, 1200 horsepower all in. But it does achieve 30 knots and it drives very well indeed. So you'd have to say that once again, absolute principle of providing no engine options at all seems to have worked for it. Now let's make our way up onto this starboard side deck. Here's the fuel filler. There's a matching one on the port side. So filling up does involve draping a couple of pipes, but nonetheless, it's a pretty safe feeling walkway, I have to say. The rail comes right up to hip height. And even though it's not a trawler style boat, there is a little lip just above to give you a degree of protection and that increases as you head aft and step down into the cockpit itself. Heading forward, well, the skipper's door is open now quite usefully. So as you can see, the space to squeeze past there is relatively tight, but doable. And then you take a couple of steps up to this elevated bow where we get quite a pleasing arrangement, a nice big forward facing bench seat, easily sit five people there, a fold out table. And here we have a sunbed, currently rigged as a sunbed, but of course you can lift that backrest, create another bench facing aft. So you can have dinner up here for seven or eight people, I'd have thought. Let's make our way round to the port side. You'll notice we've also got these little lights, automatic LEDs. We've got some more forward just to give you an ambient glow when you're up here in the evening. And we also have these. Now these are the receptacles for uh, rods, which enable you to elevate a sunshade over this bow. 
that gives you full standing headroom. We don't have that on board at the moment, so we can't illustrate that. But as you can see, we do also have some more easy access storage cavities beneath that seating. Again, filled with canvases and so on, just for gear you need quickly to hand. It's very practical in that regard. Let's make our way back down the port side and head into the saloon. As we do so, you'll see that the port window has been opened wide up. That's a massive aperture there. Really opens up that saloon to the elements. Improves your views, certainly improves ventilation. And as you move round to the back, now this is very pleasing. What we have here is a three-part patio door. So the interaction actually between the galley and the guys in the aft cockpit is very good, particularly because we've got a single level deck, barely a threshold at all there. So the two spaces do feel pretty well integrated. We've got an L-shaped galley on the port side. Got some useful little retainers to keep your pots in position. And this is a four-ring induction hob. We've got an oven down below there and some additional storage spaces in there. There's plenty more storage on the starboard side as well, actually. Here, further aft, we have a nice big fridge and freezer. And ahead of that, some neat little storage spaces built into that angle. While we're talking about angles, it's also worth noticing that we have angles elsewhere on this boat. It has plenty of interest, it makes it feel just that bit more charming. We saw something similar on the Fairline Squadron and we enjoyed it greatly there, but here, it's quite subtle, but equally effective. As you can see, it'd be very easy just to create a right angled dinette on the port side. What they've done is slightly angled the forward seat. Adds a bit of interest, as I say, but it also makes it much easier to get in and out when there are other people sitting down. And that can also be dropped into the space, as you can see, so you can use that as a dining station or a more casual sort of coffee lounge. And we have a settee on the starboard side with plenty of storage again beneath that, facing inboard across to that dinette, plus a TV that pops out of the space just behind here. Though to be honest, these windows are so massive, it's quite possible you wouldn't want to spoil the view. Now let's make our way down to the lower deck, because on a lot of absolute cruisers, this is where some slightly unconventional design decisions tend to get made, and it's no different with this 52 Fly. Now in terms of the basic arrangement, we've got the owner's cabin forward. That in itself is quite interesting. We've got a big VIP guest cabin, full beam, further aft. And between the two, we've got a twin cabin on the starboard side, day heads on the port side. Now, what I particularly like here is the fact that they've used a bonk head, so you don't enter the forward cabin directly. It takes a dog leg round to the side, and that creates the space to position the double bed here, leading off that bulkhead in the broader part of the boat. And to maximise the value of that, of course, they've positioned the heads compartment up in the V of the bow, the most tapered part of the boat. And that again makes loads of sense, but there's still sufficient room to enjoy yourself a little bit in here. There's a decent size of shower on the starboard side. You can see where the hull angles kick in. So they really have made this space work as hard as possible. More storage, quite neatly arranged behind those vertical slats. And a good size of sink and mirror on the port side. Again, with loads of storage. It really is a strength on this boat. Headroom, as you can see, is pretty decent. Good enough for anyone up to around about six foot three, six foot four, I would have said. But if you move back into this space, well, it does feel particularly generous. And it's particularly practical too, particularly if you tend to berth in Mediterranean marinas, because of course the fact that you position the owner's cabin right up in the bow distances you from the pontoon itself and gives you better views through your hull windows because you're slightly more separated from the boats. And look at the scale of those hull windows, absolutely massive up here, fantastic views loads of natural light. It's a really attractive place to be. There's also a little dressing table here on the port side as you enter with a little stool that just pulls out. Pleasant cabinetry, more built-in storage. It's a classy spot, no two ways about that. <clears throat> and then if we take a couple of steps down and head aft, we find ourselves in what on most boats would be the owner's cabin. As you can see, it's full beam. Lots of storage on both sides. Again, enormous 
whole windows. And in spite of the fact that it's a mid-cabin, really decent headroom in the main part of the cabin itself. As we head further aft and the deck head drops a touch, well, that comes up to about halfway up my face. I'm a six footer, so we've still got about five foot six of uh, standing headroom in there. Plenty of access to both sides of the boat. Now, what some people might see as a bit of an issue is the fact that this full beam guest cabin doesn't come with access to its own dedicated ensuite bathroom. There's not quite the space for that because we have a convertible twin cabin on the starboard side. We'll take a look at that now. Happily, it's been converted into a double. That's a push button operation because that opens up this little companionway and that reveals something that might surprise you. Now, it's a trait that's common to a lot of absolute flybridge cruisers. If we open this little door, you get access into an engineering space that really is very valuable indeed. We've got a little switchboard here on one side. We've got the black water tank on the other. And ahead of us, we've got a battery bank and access to your bow thruster. Really impressive that, isn't it? Very thoughtful indeed. And if we move back a little bit and check out an additional compartment here, you'll see it's really quite a practical cruising boat in other ways. Check that out. All your pipe work beautifully labeled. So if you have an issue or you've got to work on any element of your system, you know exactly where to come and what to isolate. Let's close that up and head back out of here and check out the heads compartment. It's up one step on the port side and it's a really good size. Lots of lovely access, no difficulty there. You can walk straight in without stooping. And once you're in here, you'll see that we've got a good size of shower compartment aft. And it pretty much mirrors the kind of fit out of the ensuite for the owner up in the bow. A single sink, lots of work surface, good storage, good size of toilet and lots of mirrored surfaces. Very little in the way of natural light. All we've got is a little porthole there in the shower compartment just to get rid of steam. But it serves perfectly well and it's easily accessed from that central stairwell that leads up to the saloon. And while we're here actually, there's one other thing to show you. And it's this. If I pull that, you'll see this is a concertina door. Just so you can open it right up but not block the companionway. And what we have in here is shelving. But actually, this is the space where you could fit a good size of washer dryer. And it's little touches like that all over this boat that illustrate the way Absolute likes to do things. Everything is designed in house. And it means that they can go through the design stages, argue about various things like this, come to blows, and then come to a proper solution that actually works. This then is a boat that I really like, but in all honesty, I knew I was going to like it because it's a distillation of the elements that have made the latest Flybridge cruisers from Absolute so attractive. And for a start, it looks brilliant with those split hull windows fore and aft. The lower deck arrangement is really satisfying and unusual and practical for cruisers. And then there's the day boating spaces, very versatile. There's plenty of versatility deliberately dialed into them so you can tailor it to the way you like to go boating. So in short, if you're looking for a really user-friendly family flybridge cruiser around about the 55 foot mark, this is one you absolutely need to check out.